this exquisite opportunity for us to gather a couple of times a month in an art gallery, you know. I mean, wherever else I'll preach the rest of my life, it's going to be hard to say that I preach to Maryland, you know, in the back wall. <laughs> or that I had mermaids smoking cigarettes behind me. <laughs> and it, it couldn't make me happier. So, <laughs> so thank you for this opportunity. It's, it's a real joy. And as Maria said, we want to keep these relationships strong. And we do mean it. Um, you know, especially with retirement on the horizon, we'll have more time. And we definitely look showing people around Charleston. There's some great seafood. If you're not into that, there's some great vegan food. If you're not into that, well, there's some great music. <laughs> we can find something. So, love to have you come visit. And thank you. Thank you again for this, this experience. It's been a real blessing. Let's say together. We rejoice together and we grieve together as one. Help us to remember that every human heart holds its own joys and sorrows. This is a quotation I wanted to share with you from uh, Reverend A. Powell Davies, who was a famous Unitarian minister uh, back in the 40s. He was uh, the minister at All Souls Unitarian Church in Washington, D.C. And he, I'll talk about it a little bit more in the sermon. But, uh, let us open our hearts to Christmas. Open them to all the hope that stands against a world that wastes with evil things. Open them wide enough for gentleness in a world that is bitter and harsh. For loveliness in a world that is desolate. For faith and its joy and the song of its joy that sings in the presence of God. And speaking of singing, We'll sing a, a Christmas carol now that was written by a Unitarian minister, too. We have four verses. We'll see how it goes. If we uh, need to bail, we can bail. But then, 
His reading lamp's bulb had burned out, and he couldn't find a space, a spare anywhere. So there he was, parked on the grass at the extreme edge of the lot, then sonically assaulted by Jingle Bell Rock as he entered the too bright store, then jostled by the panicked shoppers looking for whatever can't miss toys that the store had sold out of two weeks ago. Bulbs, good, sensible, energy efficient bulbs were hard to find. Then he waited in an endless checkout line between a woman behind a woman whose two children couldn't stop nagging for more and better presents. And then just when he thought the whole ordeal was over, the clerk, obviously exhausted, the young woman with a fake smile on her face, had the gall to wish him a Merry Christmas. That was the last straw. Christmas, he snapped. Didn't I say I was a Christian? Don't make assumptions about my religion. Happy Hanukkah, she ventured. But Ben just glared at her. Glad Yule? Something or other Kwanzaa? Ben made an inarticulate, dismissive noise that came out sounding something like, bah, humbug. Then he went on the attack. Is there a law that says I have to celebrate something? Can't I just enjoy life? Why can't all you people just leave me alone? The fake smile stayed in place. Have a nice evening, she said weakly, probably knowing that she'd be fired if she responded in kind. Ben was starting to feel like a bully, but having come this far, he couldn't back down. He turned and stomped dramatically out of the store. What a jerk, said the next customer in line, but the clerk said nothing. Back home, the bulb work with Pickwick papers didn't seem as interesting as he had expected, so Ben scrapped the reading idea and tried going to bed early. That hardly ever worked, and he didn't think it was working tonight either. Every few minutes, he opened his eyes, and he surveyed the darkened room. Then on the back of his eyelids, he saw an odd green glow. When he opened his eyes, he saw a shimmering, familiar shape. Marley, he said. Ben, long time no see, answered the shape. Marley and Ben had co-chaired the finance committee at their Unitarian Universalist church until the older man's fatal heart attack a few months before. Marley, Ben said, surprised. You're a ghost. Don't be stupid, the man answered. There aren't any ghosts, you know that. I'm, I'm something you ate. I skipped supper, Ben objected. Well, then that explains it. But Ben felt very awake now, and he hated to be condescended to. Marley, he argued, you're dead and translucent. The ghost looked down and shook his head. Can't we just skip over this part of the and get move things moving along? You have no idea how embarrassing this is for me. Ben shrugged and Marley continued. This is one of those Christmas Eve visitations, so I'm supposed to deliver a message. You know the drill. Three more ghosts. They teach you the true meaning of Unitarian Christmas. Yada, yada, yada. Got it? I guess, Ben answered. So you are a ghost full time, or is this just a gig you pick up at Christmas? Things are tight. You take the jobs you can get, Marley answered. But it was already starting to fade. Love to chat, but I gotta go. Don't let them touch the endowment. <laughs> the room was dark again. Weird, Ben commented to no one. But he was sure that in the bright light of day, he'd come, up with, he'd come up with a rational explanation. So he closed his eyes and tried to go back to sleep. When he opened them again, the room was brightly lit by multiple candelabras, and a man in a dark Victorian suit stood at the foot of his bed. I am the ghost of Unitarian Christmas's past, he announced. <laughs> You're gonna set off a fire alarm, the man said. He took a closer look at his visitor, and then he picked up the book from his bedside table and stared at the back cover. You're Charles Dickens, he stated. It's the cutbacks, the ghost explained. We've had to double up on roles. So you're really a Unitarian ghost? 
we didn't just put you on those famous UU lists because you were a good guy and no other church had a claim on you. I was impressed when I met Channing and Emerson, Dickens explained. Then I joined the little Portland Street Chapel when I went home to London. But that's not what I'm here to show you. He snapped his fingers, and suddenly they were in a room full of people dressed in clothes that resembled the ghosts. A man dragged an evergreen tree to a corner away from the fireplace and started propping it up, while the others watched with puzzled expressions. Unitarians didn't just inherit Christmas from Orthodox Christian sects, the ghost explained. To a large extent, we invented it, or at least reinvented it. For years, the Orthodox didn't know what to do with Christmas. Easter was the big religious holiday. In England, Christmas looked more like Saturnalia than anything Christian. The actual caroling uh, tradition has more, was more like trick-or-treating than the way we picture it now. Rowdy mobs of the poor would stand outside the houses of the rich and intimidate them into offering food and drink. The Puritans hated the whole idea so much that the Massachusetts Bay Colony would fine you for celebrating Christmas. Who are these people? We're in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1832 in the home of Charles Fallen, the Unitarian minister and abolitionist. It's seven years before he'll found the congregation in Lexington that's named for him today. Right now, he's bringing a tradition from his native Germany to America. This is the first Christmas tree in New England. Dickens snapped his fingers again. The man was dripping, was dipping a steel pen into an inkwell. Edmund Sears, the ghost explained. Another Unitarian minister writing, it came upon a midnight clear in 1849. Snap. Now a woman was writing. Lydia Child, good friend of Margaret Fuller, writing over the river and through the woods. Snap. A man was pecking out a familiar melody on a piano. James Pierpont, Pierpont, music director of his brother's Unitarian Church in Savannah. That's Jingle Bells, Jim Ben said. Then he got a sinking feeling. We're not responsible for Jingle Bell Rock, are we? <laughs> Not even a little bit. The ghost snapped his fingers again, and now it was Dickens sitting at a desk with a blazing fire behind him. When I wrote A Christmas Carol, I wasn't really recapturing the lost spirit of Christmas. I was conjuring it out of whole cloth. My Christmas wasn't about the birth of one set Savior. It was about the brotherhood and sisterhood of all people. It was about compassion and friendship and family, universal values. It was a Unitarian Christmas, Ben realized out loud. Dickens snapped his fingers again, and Ben was once again alone in the darkened bedroom. When he opened his eyes some while later, another familiar figure sat beside his bed. I know you, Ben said excitedly. You're the ghost of Unitarian Christmas present. But you're great. I've seen you in your movies, and I eat. Let's not make a big thing out of it, the ghost said, the bright lights reflecting from his famous blue eyes. I'm just a guy. With a wave of his hand, the scene changed. This is my church, Ben said. The Midnight Eve Christmas service. The Midnight Christmas Eve service. I've never been to one. The sanctuary was lit by a single candle. As they walked up the center aisle, the singing began. A carol was following by a reading, was followed by a reading, and then by a hymn. At each interval, a few more candles were lit, and then the room kept getting brighter. It's a beautiful ritual, the ghost had observed. Each person gets out of it what they bring to it, and a little bit more. That's how community works. Gradually, the church got brighter. During the final song, the flame was passed from one person to another until everyone in the congregation held a lit candle. The ghost pointed to someone lighting his neighbor's candle. This man is a Unitarian Universalist Christian. The story of Jesus touches something deep in him. The fact that his fellow parishioners are here with him, listening to the story, singing the songs. This moment of solidarity means the world to him. 
to pews up an old woman supported herself with both arms while a girl of eight years old held a songbook open. She's been coming to this service since she was a girl herself. In her mind, five generations are here, everyone from her grandmother to her granddaughter. And some people wish they were here, the ghost continued, waving his hand, but they can't be. The fluorescents at the discount store were harsh in comparison to the sanctuary's candlelight. The young clerk sighed over her cash drawer. She's off by $4.83, said the ghost. She's counted it three times. Reluctantly, the woman reaches under the counter for her purse, found a five, and made change for herself. On the strap of her purse was a flaming chalice pen. She said, you, you, Ben asked. You're surprised, asked the ghost. You think all clerks are fundamentalists? I didn't say that, Ben protested to no one. He was back in his bedroom alone. The third ghost appeared almost immediately. It's the face and body hidden in the dark cloak. In a creepy voice, it announced, I am the ghost of Christmas yet. Marley? Ben guessed. The cowl fell back to reveal a face. It's the cutbacks, Marley said. We've had to double up on rolls. Well, at least you're looking less green now. Can we get on with this? He stamped his foot, and they stood in front of Ben's church. It was dark. This is the future. I mean, it's a future. It's not the future. If it was the future, there wouldn't be any free will, which makes this whole exercise pointless. Ben started to comment, but Marley continued his spiel. In this future, the Unitarian Christmas, the Dickens Christmas, it's gone, over. There are sectarian types who think society is fighting a war on Christmas, and they feel oppressed. There are mirror image radicals on the opposite side who resent having a sectarian holiday forced on them. And then there are the multinational corporations selling junk made in China and running obnoxious ads to make people think they want. That's the Christmas of this future. It sucks. And some little part of it is your fault. Got it? Got it, Ben said. Sunlight was streaming through his bedroom window. Ben looked at the clock and realized that he could still make a small Christmas morning meditation service. Drinking coffee afterwards, he introduced himself to the clerk and apologized to her. Her name was Melanie. Ben was surprised how gracious she was about the whole event. As they parted, she asked, So, if not Merry Christmas, what should I wish for you? Well, how should I greet you? Maybe um, peace on earth, Ben suggested. Peace, Melanie agreed. You can't go wrong with peace. <laughs> <laughs> That's a beautiful little story that I found so inspiring and wanted to share. Um, it tells you a lot about the Unitarian tradition of Christmas in a, in a humorous way. And that's always a win if you can convey information and do it with a sense of humor that helps us really connect to it. Well, um, my sermon is going to be shorter today <laughs> because the radio drama lasted a little bit longer. Uh, but I do have comments I want to say. Um, but first, uh, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> and say back to your neighbor, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> it's so good to remember that we are connected. You know, we're sitting and seating, facing forward, but Think about yourselves in a, one great circle here. And uh, that's what we're in. It's one great circle of love. So good morning. Merry Christmas and, well, peace on earth. <laughs> uh, I read the story of the ghost of Unitarian Christmas earlier uh, this week, and I knew I had to share it with you. What a funny story. I love this profound reinterpretation of Dylan, uh, Dickens' timeless classic, and I hope you liked it. Christmas is a time for telling and sharing stories. There are so many, so many, that come out this time of year. 
Uh, you know, grandmother gets run over by a reindeer, right? <laughs> and uh, what would Christmas be like if we didn't have Will Ferrell dressed up as a green elf? And what would Christmas be like if we didn't have Clark Griswold in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation decorating like mad? And who could forget little Ralphie, who all he has ever wanted for Christmas is a Red Ryder BB gun. And all he's ever heard from his parents is, you'll shoot your eye out. There are older stories, like the Nutcrackers, beautiful ballet. There's uh, the Little Drummer Boy. So many beautiful Christmas stories from around the world. But all of these stories stem from the ancient and profound story about a child being born in a barn with shepherds and angels attending and then being visited by wise men, astronomers, following a star to find the manger in order to offer gifts befitting the king, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The holiday season is rich with layers and layers of meaning and cultural significance. Sometimes we have to revert to short stories to glimpse its meaning, and I'd like to do that just briefly now. I want to visit, as I mentioned in the newsletter, the short story by O. Henry called The Gift of the Magi. O. Henry uh, is a pseudonym, and his real name is William Sidney Porter, and what an interesting short life he had. He was actually born in Greensboro, North Carolina, so he's a native North Carolinian, a Tar Heel. He was born in 1862. He moved to Texas as a young man and got married. He worked as a ranch hand in Texas uh, as a young man. He worked as a pharmacist at one point. He worked as a bookkeeper and then as a bank teller. He often wrote some of his stories at night. He was accused of embezzling money at the bank, so he fled to Honduras for a, a safe uh, getaway. He stayed there for a number of months until he heard that his wife was dying. Then he returned to be with her, got captured, she died. He had to serve a prison sentence. All the while in prison, he wrote his stories. And when he got out, he moved to New York City and began what many will say is one of the more prolific writing careers of, of an author. And then he died at the age of 47. He packed a lot of experiences into such a short life. And his stories are really unforgettable. The Gift of the Magi was written in 1905, but its meaning is timeless. Christmas is coming, and a couple, you all remember this story, a couple, Jim and Della, want to give each other a precious, meaningful Christmas gift. Jim works at a small company, making a meager salary, but it's enough to squeak by. Della is a loving housewife and homemaker, but with no income of her own. She has scraped and saved for months, saving back pennies from the grocery money in order to have a little bit of money to buy Jim a Christmas present, but it just wasn't enough. Although they lived in a rented room with barely enough money to make it, each of them has a precious treasure uh, in which they take immense pride. Jim has an heirloom gold watch handed down from his father from his father's father, all the way back to his grandfather. Family treasure, a timepiece, kind of marking the time of his generations. Della took pride in a natural gift, beautiful cascading brown hair. Hair so beautiful that it would be envied by a queen. In order to get Della a Christmas gift, he felt that she deserved Jim sold his gold watch. In an act of generosity and sacrifice, Jim bought Della a set of combs, and they're described this way. They were made of pure tortoise shell with jeweled sides. An exquisite gift she had gazed upon many times in the department store, but with no realistic way to purchase them. Della, on the other hand, saved back pennies from the grocery and cleaning budget for months but she was only able to save back $1.87. And even in 1905, this was not enough to do what you need to do. Nowhere near enough to get the gift that she had in mind for Jim. 
a gorgeous uh, watch chain for his family treasure. So, in an act of generosity born of sacrifice, Della sold her long, beautiful hair to a wig company to raise money to buy Jim's gift. A gift that she was sure would bring him delight. She sold her hair for $20 and paid $21 for a platinum watch chain for Jim. When Jim got home on Christmas Eve, he was shocked to see that Della had cut her hair. He was speechless, in fact. This rendered the gift he got for her at the expense of his grandfather's pocket watch useless, at least for the time being. Della was worried about Jim's reaction, thinking that he didn't see her as beautiful with her hair cut short. They were both shocked to realize that the carefully selected things they planned as gifts for the other were now basically useless. What good is a watch chain if you don't have a watch? What good are combs for the hair if there is no hair? But Jim and Della are happy at the end of the gift of the Magi because each one of them knows how much they are loved by the other, the sacrificial generosity of one giving to the other. Both Della and Jim sold the item that they owned that was the most valuable thing that they had in their worldly possessions in order to buy a gift for the other. Their love was sacrificial, a gift not from an abundance of resources, but a gift that is costly. Such a fever pitch of consumerism that is much of today's world of Christmas time. What good, really, is an O. Henry parable? Why would I share this with you today? Why do I see redeeming value in it? Because I think it cuts to the heart of the meaning of this season. It cuts to the heart of the importance of Christmas as light coming into the world, as kindness that spills out from relationships of brotherhood and sisterhood, of compassion, that spills forth from what we have to meet the needs of those who have less than us. The example of Jim and Della and their sacrificial giving to each other is an example for us in our relationships with each other and with our communities. In stark contrast to the haze of holiday cheer we now experience, the story reminds us that true love, true kindness, true gift giving is costly and born of sacrifice. The love of a couple, whether in marriage or long-term partnership, will know many episodes of sacrificial love. The love of a parent for a child is based completely on sacrificial giving, at least for the first several years. The care and support we give one another as brothers and sisters in community is born of sacrifice. Think of the courage of our vets serving the trenches in World War II defending us. Arthur Powell Davies is another uh, famous Unitarian minister. His uh, dates are 1902 to 1957. He's a famous orator and influential <coughs> minister at uh, the Unitarian Church Fellowship in Washington, D.C., All Souls. In 1944, he gave a classic Christmas sermon entitled, Christmas Always Begins at Midnight. Davies gave this wartime sermon in Washington, D.C. as our country was in its fifth year of a terrifying war against Nazi Germany. In his sermon, he speaks about some of the most important gifts we can give to one another in challenging times. The gift of encouragement and spiritual resilience. He says, Whenever we feel pessimistic, Concerning the future of humanity upon this troubled planet, we can always remember this, that with all his fears and failings, man has yet somehow managed to put up the brightest of his festivals in the darkest part of the year. Not at midsummer, but at midwinter. He celebrates most universally his hope and his joy. So let us open our hearts to Christmas. Open them to all the hope that stands against the world that waste with evil things. Open them wide enough for gentleness in a world that is bitter and harsh, for loveliness in a world that is desolate, for faith and its joy and the song of its joy that sings out the presence of God. 
This morning, I invite you as I invite myself. I encourage us to open our hearts to Christmas. This vision of light coming to darkness. This vision of kindness overcoming unkindness, of compassion reaching out to the needy, of sacrificial love in our relationships for the betterment of our communities, our families, and the world. And as I wrap up my time with you this morning, uh, I have to say what gifts you have given to me to us. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to convey my deep gratitude to each one of you for the extraordinary gift of your partnership in this work uh, and having me as your minister. I came to you as one who was rather burned out by my experience in serving in churches. And I had little hope that I would return to such an experience as this. But little by little, chalice lighting by chalice lighting, conversations, encouragements, board meetings and concerts, mutual support, kindness, you have loved me back into the circle of divine love, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, reminds me of the picture of the Unitarian Universalist chalice with the two concentric circles, remember that? Um, it's often portrayed by the poem Outwitted by Edwin Markham, who was born in 1852. I quote a section of the poem. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic rebel, thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. Thank you for taking me in. Love and you drew a circle that invited Maria and I to join you in the circle. And, uh, we will continue to be forever grateful. You brought in a weary soul from the existential cold. Hug me and surrounded me with mermaids smoking cigarettes. <laughs> what could be better than that? <laughs> Marilyn, always smiling at my jokes. I mean, what could be better than that? Your beautiful faces, I look out and have the privilege of seeing every time we're together. Of your challenges, your comments, your support, your critiques, your ideas. Um, your invitations, they mean the world and will continue. So thank you.